we want to simplify a little bit, uh, social security is really the protection which is provided by society. It has two main functions. One of them is to compensate for the loss of income. Uh, uh, when you are, for instance, unemployed, you have a loss of income, so social security uh, should, uh, should come in and support you. Uh, so providing this financial support. When you need to also, uh, you are sick and you need to um, uh, go to the doctor and uh, you, this has uh, financial consequences for you and your family, social security comes here uh, uh, to provide this financial support. And the other function is to facilitate access to social services, which can be uh, health services, of course, but you may have other social services. And the whole um, types of benefits that social security brings you, these are called social transfers. Um, so very to really simplify uh, what are social transfers, you have different types. And this is a very simplified typology. You will find a more advanced and detailed one on the JEST platform. So we put the link here. And you will have, of course, this presentation in your manual. So you can refer to it. Uh, you have two big types of transfers, so those who are contributory and those who are non-contributory. Uh, so contributory, uh, both uh, workers, employers, the government have to contribute to them, and non-contributory, it's uh, mainly financed by taxes. Um, so under the contributory one, you have, of course, all the social insurance types of schemes that are uh, usually pro um, uh, provide a protection which is compulsory. People, if they are uh, enrolled in the formal sector, work, uh, formal sector, for instance, they really have to, uh, by law, um, register under social security schemes. Uh, you also have other types of schemes that we call voluntary or automatic. For instance, you may have a corporation, a mutual, um, a group of people who want to get uh, social insurance for their members, so they, they decide to voluntarily join. This is the case, for instance, when social security institutions, such as in Thailand with social security organization, try to expand coverage to the informal sector. Usually they, they establish social insurance funds, but the uh, membership is voluntary. Yeah? And under the non-contributory schemes, you may have targeted or non-targeted schemes. Targeted means that uh, you will target only certain groups of people, the most vulnerable, vulnerable usually. Um, this can be um, conditional cash transfer, targeted access to, to healthcare through, for instance, the Jankes Mas scheme in Indonesia, which is really targeting the poorest. Uh, Non-targeted, it means universal schemes. Either you are in the informal sector, so not, not covered by social insurance, either you are rich or or really poor, you will be covered by this scheme. It can be also what we call categorical schemes. You target a category of persons. For instance, all the persons above 60 uh, years of age will get a minimum pension. So this is really to uh, classify the different social security schemes. The reality is, as usual, much more complex because you have also schemes which are partially contributory, etc., etc. So we go to the second part, which is uh, how to extend social security and what is the ILO strategy to extend social security. So if, if you look at this graph, many people here know this graph already because I'm always explaining this graph. Uh, so if you know me, you know this graph. So, <laughs> so it, on this graph, you have um, on the horizontal side the population of a country. Of course, it's very schematic. Yeah? And on the vertical side, you have the level of protection. Uh, among the population, you have people in the formal sector. Usually, they have access to already some kind of social protection. It depends on the countries. Huh? In Cambodia, for instance, they, the, the level of the bar should be <laughs> here. But it depends. Yeah? And the rest of the informal se the population, which is composed of informal economic workers, and within them, uh, you have some poorer segments. Usually, they don't have much. So the idea of the extension of social security is to uh, expand coverage to those who are not covered. This is what we call the horizontal extension. So it's uh, putting more bars in this direction, basically. And also in the countries where the 
the bars are not very high, continuing to reinforce existing schemes so that they provide higher levels of benefits. This is the idea of extension. So there are two dimensions in the extension, an horizontal dimension, covering more people, and a vertical one, uh, providing higher levels of benefits. Yeah? So for a long time, social security was mainly contributory, compulsory, and mainly adapted to the formal sector. And uh, the ILO and others assumed that these schemes would progressively manage to cover more people in the informal sector because the assumption was that the informal sector would progressively shrink. But this didn't happen. What happened on the opposite is that the informal sector is still here and even in some parts of the world growing. So in uh, 2001, there was a big discussion at the International Labour Conference on Social Security, which came up with this report. So we brought some examples if you want to have a look at it. As Celine said, all these documents are on our JES platform. So in case anybody grabs one and there's no, no one left, no report left for you, you can still find it online. So this report, the idea was to to explore new ways of expanding social security because we knew that already that through um, uh, that, that our initial assumption was wrong. So uh, through this report, we uh, recommended the IO member states recommended uh, exploring new strategies such as, um, for instance, social security schemes may want to develop a new products, new new types of um, benefits. Uh, especially targeted to the informal sector. Uh, another strategy was to co uh, consider the development of micro-insurance. Another strategy, of course, was to, oh, was to uh, develop social assistance programs, which are non-contributory. So this, uh, this was in 2001, so during 10 years, many countries explored many different strategies. Today, in our region, in ASEAN, um, we have a very diverse situation huh? from one country to the other, but in many of the countries you have a number of programs that exist that cover some parts of the uh, informal sector, but this uh, landscape is quite scattered. Um, so you have, for instance, uh, like in Indonesia, some programs who target only the poorest of the informal sector, leaving the rest of the informal economy uncovered. You have, again, in this country, an attempt to expand coverage through pilot programs to the rest of the informal sector, but it's very difficult. It doesn't work really well. So uh, the situation is not really satisfactory, let's say. In only a few countries, like Thailand, you already have universal schemes that really provide social protection to the whole population which is uncovered, like the universal healthcare scheme uh, for the, all the population who is uncovered in Thailand, all the old, or also the old age allowance. So our idea with the social protection floor, and this idea came, came up little by little since uh, over the last years, but it, it had a <laughs> it was reinforced with the UN um, major move after the crisis to, to, to come up with some initiatives to face the crisis and accelerate recovery. So the social protection floor initiative was launched in April 2009. And so let's say that April 2009 is really the start of this initiative. Uh, so our idea with the social protection floor uh, is that uh, countries should progressively uh, implement or guarantee um, a minimum set of social security benefits to the whole population. The way they do it, it's under their responsibility, of course, but there is this idea of a minimum guarantee to the whole population so that all the holes that I was showing on the previous graph can be filled and that at least everybody has access to this minimum level of social protection. This is the idea of the social protection. And the idea also is that we wouldn't stop there, but that progressively, based on this floor, because people would have at least something already, we could build higher levels of social protection through, for instance, 
uh, partially contributory schemes to provide uh, a, a higher levels of social protection to those who are convinced that social protection is something good for themselves and their families. And then, after 10 years of discussion on how this extension can be done, came the social protection fraud concept. But already countries like Cambodia were discussing this idea to provide a minimum guarantee for all. And it's very interesting to note that in the social protection, national social protection strategy of Cambodia, there's a clear reference to this concept of providing a universal coverage to all. The strategy really focused target on the most vulnerable. And uh, more recently, during the 100, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I see, in June 2002, was uh, discussed the recommendation for social protection floors. And it was uh, unanimously adopted, one, abstent, uh, one abstention, which is also a very rare case in the history of the ILO. And I think it really reaffirmed the commitment that we need to work for better social protection. We need to extend the coverage. Only one abstention. Yeah. The social protection for, uh, comprises four guarantees, as we already explained this morning, and um, Maurizio Bussi also introduced in his opening remarks, because it's behind us, and it will lead the workshop for the week. The four guarantees are the first one, all residents have access to ex essential health care. This is the guarantee number one. The second one is all children enjoy income security. Doesn't mean that children, they go to work. It means that you have social transfer for them to access to nutrition, health care, education. The third one is all those in active age group, all the working population can enjoy a sufficient and stable income security throughout their life. And this will provide them security in case of working injury, maternity, disability, and employment, and many other. And the last one is all residents in all age and with disability, person with disability have income security through pension or transfer in kind. Those are the four guarantees of the floor. The other idea in the in promoting the social protection floor, it's not that you have one solution, one formula for all countries, one, not one or one size fits all approach. The recommendation provide guidelines, recommendation as it says, um, explaining how to do it, but then it's left to the government with the stakeholders at the national level to define the guarantees and how they will reach this universality. This is why the full title, in fact, of the recommendation is a recommendation concerning national flaws of social protection. And I think it's very important to stress this national, when we talk about social protection flaw, nationally defined social protection flaw. And as Valerie said, it can be a, a large variety of different schemes to be implemented. The other idea of the social protection floor is the close linkage with employment. I mean, linkage and delinkage. <laughs> the Convention 102, until we had this discussion with the consensus in 2001, the ILO and other organizations working on social security were linking the benefits to social security to employment. It was mainly for persons covered by a contractual relationship with an employer and with schemes contributed, funded by employers and workers' contribution. This is what we call social insurance. But the social protection floor reinforced this idea of universality, which will also focus on the informal economy workers, where you don't have this contractual relationship with one employer. But at the same time, the social protection floor also clearly promotes employability, increasing capability of persons so they can return to employment or they can integrate sustainable and decent employment. With this idea of progressively graduating to better forms of employment, better protected. And then people, by integrating those employment, can contribute also better to the economy. We always say that social protection floor is an investment in human capital. 
Um, and uh, we say that, and it, it, it seems obvious because when you invest, you provide access to healthcare, to education, to people, they will um, better contribute to, the, to a productive and uh, efficient uh, workforce in the future. Uh, people who are more skilled, who are healthy, of course, they can produce more. This is the basic idea behind that. Uh, but actually, the situation is a bit more complex than that. Um, first, the social protection by providing, for instance, transfers. We talked about social transfers that can be in cash or in kind. Uh, contributes to uh, increase the, the consumption of the household. Um, and this has direct effects uh, on the on the people themselves in terms of levels of poverty, in terms of uh, reduction of inequalities. And it has also indirect uh, effects. Um, indirect effects because if you consume more, this you, you consume more goods and this therefore will boost the production of, the, uh, of your country, the domestic production. Uh, second, this effect on the household cons consumption has also behavioral effects. Uh, for instance, if you, uh, if you provide access to education or health, uh, people uh, will be more healthy, as I was saying, and therefore the human capital of the country will, be, uh, will grow. Um, the human capital has a direct impact on labor productivity. At the same time, we, we see that uh, through social transfers, uh, these transfers can be used for consumption of, of goods, consumption of food, uh, access to health, education, etc. But they can also be used to uh, buy assets uh, and particularly um, productive to do productive investment, for instance, uh, by uh, by a cow, by a car, etc., that would contribute to increase the physical capital. Yeah? So with the human and the physical capital, you have a direct impact on labor productivity. Also, as Céline was just saying, when you provide transfers to people, people who are really vulnerable, this helps them, for instance, to find a new job because they will be finally able to, uh, to buy their bus ticket to go to the employment center, for instance, and find a new job or to submit a CV, etc. So this has a direct impact as well to their productivity, employability. And all this, the, the increase in labor productivity of the country, the increase in the demand of, for goods and services is good for the economic performance at the macro level. Yeah? And uh, if you have more growth in the country, more performance, this, is, this contributes again to uh, increase the wages, to increase the income, and therefore household consumption. And as well as uh, through taxes, it contributes to increase the revenues of the government uh, and therefore the capacity of the government to uh, contribute more to social protection. So you see it's really the idea is that it's really um, a virtuous cycle. Yeah? If you start investing uh, in social protection today, this will uh, lead to a virtuous cycle. And um, normally, uh, little by little, this will generate more growth and generate also more uh, income for the country as a whole to finance more social protection. This is our strong assumption uh, and we try to demonstrate that through evidence and also um, this, this graph comes from the uh, Maastricht School of Governance. The uh, Cambodian counterparts here know that Francisca Gassman and her team have already started developing a model to show that with, with numbers, to show this virtuous cycle, which is called the rate of return of social protection. <laughs>